All right. We'll let some people get into this one. This one's going to be nice and nice and fun to have a good discussion with you guys. It's been quite the last few days. I have showered and changed, even though I'm wearing another VBT shirt. So that's why you're you're not in the time warp. I actually have more than one of these and have been rocking the uh, the logo here. I'm going to make sure that people know that come on. We're going to have this discussion and let folks understand the, some of the background a little further deeper. And then we can get into some more detail once we have a few people in here. I like having an audience the feedback loop to start here. Let's see here. Let's make sure that this got shared out. So people know that we're doing a live stream right now. And it actually looks like it's, it went perfect. Oh snap, did I get the opportunity to say first, shucks. Adrian says, hello from Illinois. Hello from Switzerland. What's going on guys? I know Son of Tech's doing a video too right now, so I um, think he's covering some issues that he's having with the bots. I've had quite the bot experience right now with uh, the YouTube comments right now. It's gone pretty crazy. As the, as the infrastructure and everything else has came heavy into crypto also so has the the scams and bots trying to steal your guys's cryptos within the youtubes nobody's talking nothing but profits yeah it's been pretty uh we'll get into that that's part of the issue with a discussion like this is when you talk proof of work and you talk incentive, the incentive is a monetary amount. And that's always going to be this. The discussion is always going to go to profit and calculations like that. But there's a lot more than just a network profit. There's also security. And that's what this has been around. Do you think I should build a mining rig at the moment? Well, if you're paying overpaying for GPUs, no, if you get a good deal on, on GPUs, it's still a very nice time to get in. I would not overpay for GPUs right now. Just take your time. GPU mining is going to be around for a lot longer than Ethereum. There's a lot of networks out there. Kind of a bad time now. You can try to get cards MSRP, says Twinson. That is true. <laughs> the Tarwin Ward gets handed out. NVIDIA unnerfed their driver. Yeah, I don't know who would have actually messed that one up. That's uh, That's some funny stuff, man. Hello from Brazil. Nice, my dude. Beautiful country. What? No green hat for St. Patrick's Day. That's tomorrow for me, right? Yeah. That's, uh, I could do, I could do a St. Patrick's stream tomorrow. Startup cost says it's, or yeah, the startup cost right now, mining's pretty high. It seems like an insider angel. Yeah, I don't know. Like, like they obviously somebody built and compiled, and there's an entire supply chain that a driver hitting their website would have to go through from like checking into master. Somebody would have to approve that. You'd probably have a build champion. There's a website person. There's a whole production. Most most development shops uh, of any sort has an entire DevSecOps chain. So. The cradle to grave to get it to a production environment meant that it probably would have had to go through quite a few people 
Um, there's testers, there's unit tests, there's builds, there's a, you know pre-prod environments, then there's a production environment, which is where it gets listed. That driver had to go through a lot of different uh, steps. Even if they have a very quick continuous delivery design, that driver had to go through some eyes before it got released. So somebody wasn't paying attention if that was not supposed to get released for that 3060. For anybody just joining there, people are curious of how NVIDIA would accidentally list up a driver that unnerfed their change to the RTX 3060 series, which was supposed to be nerfed by NVIDIA um, to not allow ether mining, you know, Ethereum mining. I do CICD and have a conscious assuming someone like me is out there, <laughs> says DF. Well, you know, I mean, it depends how quick their their CICD pipeline was. You know, if they just saw unit tests kicking off and Jenkins was good and then it did the build and somebody signed off on it and then it had a flash to bang to their web server. I mean, yeah, technically, I guess it could be. There could be technically only a couple of people. There was a build person. I mean, you could narrow that down if they had the right kind of uh, coverage. They could narrow that down to like four physical people where you'd have the person that was responsible for the development. You had the person that should have been in charge of like the smoke testing or some kind of like integration testing and would have signed off unless they're fully automated on that. But they still should probably have a belly button to push there. Um, so that would be the integration guy. And then you have a pre-prod uh, environment that would be a clone of production just to make sure that you know something doesn't go with the package it takes down the site so that's you know your pre-prod and then you would have most likely their prod environment um, so you probably would have had a build the build person this the test person uh, some infrastructure person that handles CICD standpoint, like, you know, and maybe a build champion somewhere in there just to make sure that they're doing some kind of paired programming. So you probably had like four physical people in between that before that hit NVIDIA site, I would assume. And that's in the most leanest setup if you're running like a risk adverse environment. So I don't know how NVIDIA would have, would have got that. What happened to Ethereum's core switches before POS, before April 1st? So uh, Ethereum cannot switch to POS before April 1st. That doesn't work that way. And just kind of the dovetail on the discussion I just was having with you guys, the amount of um, setup requirement to move to proof of stake is gonna take a bit. Even if they were really like on the most aggressive, running three shifts of developers, had thrown all stops out, hired a whole bunch of integration people, a whole bunch of testing. You know, Vitalik's very wealthy. He could spin up an entire other development team to try to do uh, set up, uh, you know, an ETH beacon test chain. Um, if you were going full stop, they could maybe get it done in three months, four months. If they were like, like it was an, a true existential threat, maybe two months with, with a whole bunch of broken glass. Um, but no way, no way, no how would it come out before April 1st. Um, there's an entire like governance process they go through to validate stuff. You got an entirely different team for ETH2 than ETH1. Um, you got client teams. You got a lot of smart contract owners. You got D5 people. There's a whole bunch of people that are going to want to be in the mix when it when it, the consensus switches over. Um, so that's going to be something we see coming and there'll probably be a date and then that date will probably slip because that's just the way development is. That's not a dig on Ethereum's team. So yeah, that's going to be a bit. <laughs> so, and they're in my uh, optimistic viewpoint of that, of just understanding how development works, I would say in something as big of a change as this is, given that it's a $200 billion network, I could see it within a year if they really had all their ducks in a row and it was really truly the focus, maybe by December. Um, but again, you're still going up against all the normal things. You're going against, okay, they're not going to do it in mid-December because that's around uh, Christmas and people are celebrating Hanukkah and Christmas and a lot of other holidays around that time people travel during that time so like when is it happening like that's why a lot you see a lot of stuff come out in 
mid January, February, and March because essentially you have all that build up through November, and then everybody takes a break over December, and then you have the reinvigoration happening in January, and then a lot of stuff starts landing usually in March, uh, April time frame, um, and maybe into the summer like they're going to do with uh, doing Berlin here in a few weeks, and then uh, London release on 1.0 in uh, July. So, I mean, it would be well after London. London, we know, is coming in July. Um, the the finalization of that, I think, is this Friday. I'll be part of that call. But, yeah, they still got some time. Let's see here. The code auditing takes time with itself. Yeah, there's code auditing. There's testing. They're going to want to do that. They're going to want to have at least a couple passes, I would assume, on the finality to make sure that the beacon fires correctly. Uh, it's going to be a minute for that. Um, but I think we got enough to get kind of started here. So if anybody hadn't been tracking, I did not have a video yesterday. I have been working diligently on breaking down the argument, the challenge, the perspective that I was trying to give on the ETH cat herders, which effectively fell on deaf ears um, and pushed away to say, hey, you don't know about MAV, obviously. You're missing the fact that not all the fees going to be burned. This was a new um, discovery for me from an aspect of as a as an individual miner not tracking the fact that there was a lot of gaming going on uh with regards to the pools being able to front run i know that there's front running out there because anybody and everybody can actually view the the uh mempool but the fact that a miner at the end of the day provided that they had their infrastructure set up in the right way to be able to read the block they're about to post and then do an order sort and then a re-entry on top of that to get a better deal was uh it's not something that was out of the question that could happen but just that fact that mining pools could be doing that um or they should be doing that um per the uh eth developers are kind of acted like wow you don't know that they do that it's like well i don't think all of them do i think you by explaining this to everybody right now is saying that they probably should be doing it which i don't know if it's the best activity in the world to be doing but that being said it is part of that game theory of what happens when you have a blockchain and a mempool and you have a lot of potential um actions going on i don't know how much that how good that is for the environment i think that's still more to be talked about if I'm a trader or I'm a, a sophisticated um, developer and I'm writing to get ahead of one other on the market maker side. And then at the end of the day, it comes down to the, the person that's posting that block, which would be the mining pool, being able to see that activity and say, oh, so they're going to do this and they're going to get this advantage. I'm going to copy that, insert my transaction ahead of that with a higher gas fee and I'm gonna win that as I post it, and you effectively invalidate the person stuff. It's like it's like a sophisticated cheating is what it is at the end of the day, uh, because the environment creates this event that you can do that. That's effectively what part of the miner extracted value is: is the the pool can take advantage of the situation that they are the block producer. Um, it's going to be interesting to see validators on proof of stake. And we're going to have Micah on here to, to talk. Um, well, I know he's not like heavy on the, the layer two stuff. I do want to have some discussions with him and maybe other folks from the Ethereum standpoint when we start talking about how is that going to work with like proof of stake and before the layer two roll up um, sharding changes, can they do that as a block validator? because now it's a round robin type of thing it's well it's not round robin it's a uh based on the tech spec ethereum validating nodes will be randomly selected to be the come that block producer in that po point in time so if certain block producers 
are running these scripts, do they get that also advantage to run essentially what's equivalent to the minor extracted value or not? I don't know the answer to that question completely. And I'm interested to see if they are able to do that or not, since they're just going to go straight to proof of work, straight to proof of stake and not have fixed any of that kind of architecture. In theory, it's going to work the same way. So um, Jimmy Odin says, add a note, the devs did not like the two year, this two years ago, and all of a sudden, that's a good thing. It is a question mark for me. I have still not got a clean, I guess, position from developers that this is a good thing. I don't, I don't personally like it. Um, I know that it, it generates pools, potentially more money, and it's also a stopgap from some of our fee uh, burn. However, you know, it's like, at what point is there like, is it considered cheating? Um, Cause that's effectively cheating. If I can read somebody else's behavior, like wholesale, like not make an assertion, like literally read what they're about to submit. And then I can insert that exact same thing on my behalf and cut them out of it. That's like some bullshit as far as I'm concerned. Like, so like if I was a market maker or a participant, I would look at it and be like, you guys need to fix that. Cause otherwise I'm going to use a different network. Like I don't like, I get the, it's a, it's a patch that they're trying to use to make sure that we don't take that big of a hit because they understand how, um, unpalatable you know any kind of hit on a monetary standpoint would be for the person providing you security however it's i just don't know if that's the right one to promote that's why i'm not covering a lot of me mev stuff right now because i'm not really it doesn't align with my um the way i like to hold myself if that makes sense and i don't know if i'm going to be really promoting a lot of like like i'm I understand that there's opportunity there, but I just don't know how I feel about it. Like if some pools, if all pools are doing it, we're, we're it's a byproduct of the of commercial capitalism at the end of the day because they're going to they're going to promote the fact that their yields are higher, and you should come bring your hash power to them. It's a very interesting dynamic because. You could choose a pool that chooses not to do that, and you by by definition are going to get less yield. Um, but you're doing it on the the fact that they're not doing that behavior. Maybe <laughs> you know, like they could be still doing it and just not sharing it with you. And that's a whole other thing. Like there's, and it's hard to completely extrapolate from the limited amount of time I've dove, delved into it. It's not a hundred percent easy to extrapolate every event if they're actually doing it or not. Um, some of it's more clear than others from what I've seen, and I still have more research to do on it, but it's still a questionable activity. And we're still talking about MEV, by the way. Um, but I'll, I'll put a pin in that for a second. So what I wanted to make sure, yeah, there you go. Dead pixel apart says it's there. It's just unethical. I mean, that's, that's, there's your best way to say it, my dudes. Like it's an unethical activity. And that, that from, it hits me against from like, like, do I feel good about this or not? No, I don't feel good about it. So should I partake in that or not? You know, I, I don't know. Like it just, it doesn't come to me as like a, a thing that I would normally be doing. Um, you know, uh, the original discussion of how much, you know, this was going to hit and, you know, my first knee jerk when I first read 1559, you guys have seen those videos. I put that out very early when it became a thing and we started seeing the fear, fee burn and I was very out against it. And then I started seeing some of the other effects of it. And I was like, well, you know, there's other good things in it. Maybe they can pull the fee burn out. And then you start peeling it back further and you find, well, based on the mechanic of expanding the ability to have the blocks, you know, have twice the gas, you could have a situation where people are always gaming it. So I get it. I get the mechanics of it that makes sense for a burn. I understand it. So wholesale, I've accepted the fact that we're going to take a hit on that. However, I've also came back and said, if that's the case, there, there might be consequences with that, that I don't know. Um, and those consequences may be a pullback in hash power if the cut was too deep and that kind of, that entire, discussion got turned into this whole other thing 
that is the community in general thinking it's just miners are just trying to pad their pocketbooks. And it's like, no, dude, I'm like seriously trying to have a conversation with you on understanding like it's it reminds me of a scene in Wolf on Wall Street, like where Matthew McConaughey is talking to Leo DiCaprio and he's just like, you know, you just take the money from them and you just give it to me. Like that's that that's what's going on. And that's ETH's policy since the beginning. And I get it. But I was like, just call that spade a spade. Like this isn't like I'm trying to get more money. This is like we're just doing the normal proof of work. It's 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 gained in value because of ETH's appreciation. The yields are what they are because of the dynamics of the way base fee plus block reward plus orphan exclusion has always worked. It's just circumstantially the the ETH's own success has driven these high fees because of all this automation and market makers and and all the flash bots and things that are going from the gas wars as it were so there we're we're benefiting from this mechanism that's in place um and there's going to be a part of it that's cut out and i get it but the whole point has been like well if the cuts too deep and that the price goes down for whatever reason i mean people were like calling out Three thousand, four thousand dollars to the moon. Bitcoin hit sixty-two, is pushing, and then today we wake up to like four, fifty-four thousand. Like, crypto is very humbling in its volatility sometimes, and I don't know the future, nor does anybody else say that the future. No matter what kind of mechanisms they're pulling here, so the basic analysis is as simple as: if the cuts too deep, it's going to bring down hash power. That happens with the ebb and flow happens it's happened since the beginning of crypto the delta which i wrote out in the medium article which we're going to bring up here in a second is the concern and it doesn't mean that we have to react to it immediately the eip 3368 is purely kind of a back seat something ready if we see a bad scenario happening because steering the eth development ship is like you know, a large cruiser that doesn't turn quick. So like the flash to bang, if something's going on, I don't have confidence that it can happen quick on ETH. So we need to have something in place. And that's where this comes from. So let's bring this up here real quick. So we got, I did a quick medium article. The links are below. And I try to explain to you guys, I'm not gonna read this to you guys. You guys can go through it, but I want to give some context on a basic understanding where the history came from, some of the details of the very first model, which highlighted seven scenarios. And any of this data is not 100%. This is forecasted data. We know how forecasted data works, right? Forecasted data works like you make a forecast based on some basic variables. And then any good data science or data analysis person will capture metrics as you get to that point that you forecasted and you will provide something called a latest estimate. So there is a actual, which has occurred. There's a latest estimate, which is what the current date is and what's happening. And then there's an, a, a, a forecast. I created a forecast based on essentially 10 different scenarios, a high price with high volume, which would be activity on Ethereum, high price low volume low price high volume low price low volume flat price high volume flat price low volume extremely high price with extremely high volume extremely high price with low volume extremely low volume that is extremely low price with high volume and extremely low price with low volume so it was essentially kind of a a a curve of all the different potential scenarios on the two core factors that we we really look at when we're doing any mining. If you're a mining person, you're looking at, okay, what's the price at and how much is my yield? Your yield is determined based on the amount of difficulty on a particular network. So your quick check is to see, well, what's the hash rate at right now? And then you can start to equivalent like what makes more sense for my hardware based on my hardware's output. Very basic math that all miners always look at to see, like, am am I doing something right? 
that's if they're really chasing you know a particular profit or if they're you know if they're trying to get to their ROI very fast or they may not look at all of those particular figures and they're they're just mining a network with a with a more speculative risk they call this spec mining to where you're mining something that may not have um, the price point right now but you're getting a lot of yield because the difficulty is low and that's a valid strategy for people um, but essentially those are those 10 pieces there I talked to the the, ex, the exponential growth that Ethereum's going through right now but the main data that I want to pull up here is something that I've spent the last couple days on to try to gather and break down for you guys and I want to make sure that people understand kind of how this data was put together that's the main part of this video so this is uh, kind of two views right now of the current makeup of hash rate. And this includes all GPUs that are out there. Um, well, pretty good close to all GPUs that I can ascertain on crypto networks. So this is a total terahash on Ethereum and then a derived ter partial terahash and derived terahash equivalent on all the other networks ethereum right now is about 84 percent of the total gpu makeup right now when you break that down a little further you can see and i'll show you the core data to this so don't worry the the core data shows about 77 percent of ethereum right now makes up that if you take the eth hash rentable hash power right now in nice hash and mind you i started looking at nice hash a couple weeks ago just to see where it was at in the stack it was about three and a half percent of ethereum's makeup since the linus tech tech video it is at eight percent eight linus had a five percent world net hash adjusted on nice hash i think that's like that should have its own article and its own video by itself the fact that nice hash setting at about eight percent of the eth hash available hash rate which is pretty profound actually um the all the other algorithm algorithms when you start looking at that drops those to about 14.8 percent there's a lot more data in there uh, so i spread this out to look okay i'm going to include nice hash as part of eth's number and i'm going to look at kind of the spread right now so you got ravencoin at about 5.5 percent uh eth classic at about 1.6 percent conflux about 0.6 uh Fork chain, a couple other ones in there. And there's a whole bunch. There's 30 plus algorithms in there. And we'll come down to the, the other data. So this is how, the, and I'll show you guys the spreadsheet that makes this up. This is going to be, um, or this is the kind of breakdown looking at terahashes spelled out. So it shows at the top total gigahash, well, a, a thousand gigahashes of terahash. So that's where you get the 430 at the top right there. That's what Ethereum's network is right now. You can see all the all the uh, items in white are effectively a one to one. They're a ETH hash algorithm equivalent. So the total uh, terahash right now, like most of these networks are in the giga hash. They're not even in terahash. If Thief Classic, Zaquilla, um, Cork Chain are the only ones that are in the terahash with F hash, and then the rest are in the giga hash. So not a huge amount of uh, you know. Uh, potential out there when it comes to like expanse and all those i mean it's 81 giga hash is a lot of net band net i mean the our the bbt farm right now is at 22 giga hash and that's that's a lot of gpus so i mean the fact that some of these networks have you know well more than that uh, is showing you a pretty sizable uh commitment to some of these other algorithms um when you look at the ones that are in yellow um those are derived and what i mean by derived is i took an average most uh, current efficient GPU and I looked at the algebra between if that GPU does X on F hash and it does X on a particular algorithm what is the derived amount so I'm taking an assumption here that you know if it, if that uh, since we've measured these gpus what is what's the potential amount so i used a 3080 as an example that's the latest gpu now these are going to have a whole bunch of different they're going to have our gtx cards they're going to have rx cards these numbers are not a hundred percent they i would say give them a 20 percent swing up or down on the total giga hash to terahash here but it's taking you know 
two two million souls on Bitcoin on Bitcoin or Bitcoin Gold is equal to about nine hundred and ten giga hash of GPUs, about ninety one hundred thirty eighty GPUs, and so that's how you're getting the drive there. The reason why you see Kapow a little higher is Kapow at ten point nine one terahash is equivalent. If you were to switch that ten terahash on on Ravencoin's Kapow algorithm, you would have about 27 terahash on Ethereum because Kapow has its translation is lower, right? If you're on a 3080, you're only getting 38 um, a total mega hash on Kapow, but you're getting 91 to 97 mega hash on Ethereum. So that's why you have that almost, it's not a third, um, but it's, it's in between those numbers. And that that number could actually be a little higher, actually, because some some coin or some cards actually get hit a lot harder when they're mining Kapow than they do on Ethereum. Like they have a much higher Ethereum yield output from hash rate versus Kapow. But about thirty terahash right now equivalent is on Ravencoin right now. Um, if it was to move over back over to Ethereum, and that also gives you the algebra on the other way. So like. Um, I need to update the model that I'm going to show you guys here in a second to have a little more accuracy when it comes to some of these numbers, um, because as I've modeled this, I'm trying to get a derived, you know, size of pi. The whole point of this is to make sure we can get kind of what's the total, what's the total look like here when, when I call it the sleeping dragon. What if Ethereum pulls back quite a bit? Yeah, here, let me get to this one. Let me get to the. The model here so uh, on the spreadsheet here the model looks like there's about 70 of you guys on here right now 74 viewers i think it only lets about 100 and something in but um if you click that it lets you come to this and if i go to gpu testing nope that's not the one we want and that's just some of the testing i've done with gpus here is that that data and then here is how the calculations that were used in total mega hash to do the conversions for the algebra there but here's the stuff I care about over here. So on the left over here. So if I look at all other algorithms, this is the this number 38, 39, or 37 through 38. This is what we care about. So if direct ETH F hash straight to ETH is about 390 terahash, 41 terahash is available and sitting on rentable space, which is nice hash. And then we have a potential total of another 76 terahash setting out there on other algorithms. And this is the stuff that I'm talking about. So if you have a total GPU, if I'm given a, a very, and mind you, this might be 20% up or down because of the conversions that I've done, but we have a relative uh, close number to around 500 terahash total all network GPU equivalent right now. Um, and that's assuming that F2 pool that was on the ETH cat herders call is accurate in their estimate that they think it's only 8 to 10% of ETH is on um, ASICs. I've, we've always speculated that we think that's higher. We think it's more around 30 to 40%, which um, from this attack vector actually helps ETH um, be, more. I think, more protected. But... If it is only 10%, then a majority of that, uh, you know, we're talking uh, 40, 40 terahash maybe made up of A6 of that that 400. Um, you know, we really wouldn't know unless they went in with 969 EIP and, and forked them off. But um, this is the, the, the root of what my discussion and my concern was, is as this continues to go through July, and here I'll switch back to my other video real quick and we can come back to this too but this was this has been the root of my concern is that everything's great right now it's fine like the price is up yields have been high because of the um the block rewards being what they are if that got com cut completely out i agree with all the assessments that if we went to just two block you know, where we weren't, we weren't getting any fees, no MEV, it wouldn't be, ETH would still be profitable, actually, all the way up to 
until you get about thirteen hundred um, dollars in that case. If it was just a fix to, it needs to be right around anywhere from. It depends on the setups. Let me qualify that. Your most efficient setups you can run all the way down to like almost nine hundred dollars. Um, the nine hundred dollar ETH price at two block reward with the current difficulty where it's at. This is the whole point. People don't really understand the difficulty raising up too much. So, but if we start pulling back to where the cut is a majority or fifty percent of that, and then we start pulling back to seven hundred, six hundred dollar ETH price at four hundred and twenty plus terahash, that terahash is coming off, and it's coming off in droves, like a lot. And the difference between the previous to now is that we we have more than twice the potential now. And not only do we have twice the potential, we have all these other networks that have expanded also. I did a, a research like this about two years ago, and there was a roughly about 13 terahash. This was around the same time we were doing Prog Proof of Work. There was about 13 equivalent terahash on all the other networks before. There's 76 now. So the difference is about 56 to 60 terahash equivalent on those other networks because Bitcoin has risen and a lot of the Satoshi values of some of these coins stayed the same or declined a little and rose with it. So if something was setting at 200 Satoshis and its price didn't really move, Bitcoin went up in price and it stayed at 200 Satoshis, that's the sea rises all boats. Now that's worth a higher USD value. So these networks, when you start doing the math, like, well, do I mine it or not? Almost every network out there right now short of Monero is is in profit with a lot of these different cards and it's because there's a spread and that you'll have a spread that 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 pulls off for the reasons that I was talking about earlier where some people just spec mine other coins they believe like we're mining both eth and ravencoin right now so and I think I have like one rig on uh, Ubik and I have one rig on Egym. So I, there's a few that I, I spec mine on. I have a couple here at the house that we spec mine with. That's a normal strategy. And all the different channels out there are going to tell you guys new coins and new things that might be opportunities. Some are going to have master nodes. Some are going to have whatever. But that's where you get that spread of hash power out. And... Any large change has, uh, it's about price elasticity. Does it move or not? And over time, we've seen it does move. Like the mining will go and it will do, it will do the move. All right. So I, I kind of went through that pretty quick. It's about 37 minutes. I wanted to try to get through some of that. There is the medium article out there. I'm not going to read it to you guys. Um, but I wanted to make sure you understood where the specific components of this was and where the data was to it. Um, I think there's a lot more that I can do with it. I'm literally was pressed for time to get it ahead of the the Friday meeting and just discuss to say, hey, there's an EIP out there. It takes the block reward up by one, but the emission schedule over two years is the same. If we left it at two and kept it across all both years, if mining was available for two years, you would have the same amount of inflation over those two years. If it just stayed at two or if it started at three and tilted down to one. Um, it was a, a way to ensure that you wouldn't have a drop, a, a significant drop, if a bad scenario started to play out on Ethereum. Um, I think it's a low risk. I've said it's been a low risk. It is just a risk. ETH doesn't have any kind of 51% protection. And there is a huge amount of more hash power available now. Um, and that's that's the risk. It's always been the risk. I'll take some questions, guys. I'm going to try to keep this tight to an hour. And then I would love to get back to like regularly spe scheduled stuff. I have a couple different rigs I wanted to talk about. i am been investigating a lot with NFTs. I would like to talk to that because there's I have a whole bunch of different ideas with NFTs, not really for the art side, but just some of the stuff with like the assets and uh, links of, um, you know, history and accountability. You can lock that into an item with with uh, 
you know, the, the, like we did with the Raven coin asset layer. Um, I did with the boring, not a flamethrower a uh, long time ago, but, but two years ago now. Um, I just, I'm interested in this space and a whole bunch of different reasons. So I want to, I want to get into that. Can we pay Linus Tech Tips to do a video on EIP 3368? No, no, my dude. That would be not advisable. Have you guys seen the hate that I've gotten from this thing? I'm a pretty chill dude, my dudes. And I got people like pissed off. Like I've just destroyed ETH to them. And it's like, first off, dude, it hasn't been accepted. Second off, it's literally a proposal that says optional. Um, I'm actually trying to protect your network. Like people get t stuff twisted, my dudes. Like I don't hate them for it. I mean, I'm, I'm the chillest dude. I've had people yell at me like, like hardcore about it. And it's like, man, I understand that you have like some idea that you think that I'm trying to screw you guys over or something. I am not doing that. I literally get on this screen since before ETH was even a thought in somebody's head and teaching people how to mine. Like this is not about trying to pump ETH up. Linus is expensive. I have no idea. Devs balked when you threw out the fur ETH one compromise. Why would it they be? Why would it even be a higher reward to receive any better? Um. Well, we didn't talk about a, a one ETH. I would, so the one ETH thing was about to keep the emission the same, but to make sure that the risk was lower if there was a big drop up front. Because right now we're used to the. It's not even used to. It's a bad word. The network has grown exponentially because of price and yield, and yield is partially going to get cut. So if price comes down with it, that's the risk, right? If price, like I don't know what the price is tomorrow. I bet you guys did. If anybody knew the price, and you guys have been making some serious bank when Bitcoin went from sixty-two down to fifty-four, right? But that's the whole thing. Is I don't know, like ETH could go to freaking two hundred dollars tomorrow for some stupid reason. I don't know, and if it does. I swear to God, I didn't know. I'm not for running price down to $200. Don't get that rumor started. But like, if it did, there's risk to the network. There's risk to the network because Ethereum doesn't have any 51% protection. And now the size of Pi is so big, there's 400 terahash on it, which is a lot of force projection. If there's rapid changes of something, the network's at risk. That There's nothing more, nothing less. It's that simple. And if they could react quickly, not after the fact, but react quick enough, this wouldn't even be a point. Like, I wouldn't even be bringing it up. I'm like, oh, no, they'll, they got it. They're watching. But, like, it takes a long time to get things through. So I'm trying to get ahead of it. How much pre-mine does devs own? I have no clue what they individually own. I think the initial uh, capital raise in the beginning was around 70 million ETH. I mean, ETH started effectively as its first ICO. And that's effectively, I mean, I don't, I don't discount them for doing that. I mean, they have paid for, the foundation has funded much of that development. A lot of that development. And we've seen what happens when when it's actually maintained and controlled in a particular way to encourage a lot of development in a space. We've had a massive ecosystem with Ethereum compared to a lot of the other coins. This is where I would be challenging stuff like block block one with EOS. EOS raised four billion dollars. And like I don't know, like it just hasn't really done anything. Like, is it alive? Like, what? I mean, you have $4 billion. They had a huge fund to raise uh, awareness capital. Tron's the same way. There's a lot of different solutions out there that have been funded very well and have not done um, the... And I think it's a brain drain. I think it's a... There's a lot of reasons. It's not anyone's intentions. There's a whole bunch of, like, reasons why things don't work like that. If you can't get the right personnel, you could have all the money in the world... 
but if you're like a dick to work for, like nobody will come to you. Right. I mean, so like, I think there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of other existential things that affect a project's ability to deliver things. Um, and I think, uh, I think that has a lot to do with it, but I mean, I know I've ran some pretty large projects and I'm usually a pretty simple dude to get along with. And we, we rock things out, man, but there's a lot to things. Eats GitHub has been on fire the last few days. Well, I bet. Should miners think about buying more miners to combat the decrease in rewards after the 1559? Uh, I mean, so if you're, if you're mining heavy, uh, ASIC miner, if you're mining heavy on Ethereum, I wouldn't go super long on your purchases with miners with Ethereum. I would probably heed the direction that they're saying they're going to go and they're putting an effort towards going to proof of stake. I think they're going to have a road to get to proof of stake, but I wouldn't necessarily uh, overpay in this environment to try to just mine Ethereum. I mean, if you're trying to build a miner and you're going long, like you have a a strategy where you're going to, you're going to mine other tokens. Um, and you're looking more towards the future of just proof of work in general, then you should be fine because you're going to, you're going to have times where you're probably not as profitable. Um, but if you're going long, you're, you're earning yield on a particular token. And if that token, it has a lot of good development and has the right set of, um, you know, features that are going to come out, then you might have an opportunity to where that paid off very well. Um, but if you're, if it's purely on ETH and you're predicating all your numbers on ETH and all that, I would not go that right now with the, with their, um, direction and their, their insistence that they're going to try to push up proof of stake. You know, I think there's some, some, uh, risk there to say the least.